Our first topic is literary criticism and literary theory. In the course of talking about the topic, we are going to define so what is literary criticism? That's one of the questions that we will answer in the course of the course. What is literary criticism? According to Matthew Arnold, according to Matthew Arnold, a Victorian literary critic and educationist. According to Matthew Arnold, a Victorian literary critic and educationist, a poet of high standard. Literary criticism is a, a disinterested endeavor to learn and propagate the best that is known and taught in the world. Literary criticism is a disinterested endeavor to learn and propagate the best that is known and taught in the world. I'll take that again. Literary criticism, according to Matthew Arnold, a Victorian educationist, poet, and critic. Literary criticism is a disinterested endeavor to learn and propagate the best that is known and taught in the world. The best that is known and taught in the world, unquote. So implicit in that definition, implicit in that definition, are some of the core values and characteristics of literary criticism. as well as what we should expect from the ideal critic, or what to expect from the ideal critic. A term that we need to pay attention to in the definition is disinterested. Disinterested, literary criticism as a disinterested end. What does it mean? What does that mean? for us to say that the criticism is a disinterested endeavor. That term accounts for the objectivity that is expected of the critic and his art. That term accounts for the objectivity that is expected of the critic and is art. The objectivity as expected of the critic and is art. So, ob ob objectivity is a major characteristic of literary criticism. By being objective, it means not being biased, not being prejudiced in any way. Objectivity implies being balanced in one's judgment, not being personal with one's comments of views, not imposing one's biases on the text. 
it means that the critic has to distance himself from the text so that he will say, will make a balanced judgment about the text. It does not mean lacking interest. It means being objective. A disinterested endeavor. So as you are aspiring critics, you need to understand that Literary criticism is all about making a balanced judgment about a work of art. And that's why Anno says it's a disinterested endeavor. You do not bring your biases and prejudices to impose on the meaning of the text. Okay? You don't bring your personal grudges to bear the interpretation of the text. In the first place, you need to note that the term criticism is not about condemning any text or anyone. People usually think that to criticize means to condemn. No, that is not true. To criticize does not mean to condemn. At least it does not mean to condemn alone. It does not mean that you should say something negative about this actually does not mean that you should say something negative about the work of art. To bring down the work of art and the author. To tear down the work of art and the author. To scatter, to destroy. Criticism is a noble endeavor engaged in by the best minds alive. It's only the best minds alive that engage in literary criticism. People with a elevated mindset, right? People who can rise above personal grudges and biases and prejudices Because criticism is about making a balanced judgment about a work of art. That means you have to say what is good about the work of art, as well as the pointing out the weaknesses of the work. That is what criticism is all about. You have to say the aspects that make the work great first of all, and then some other things that detract from the greatness of the work. That's a balanced judgment. And so the critic is not someone who picks a work of art and looks for all the faults. No. The critic is not an individual who picks up a work of art and looks for all the faults. The critic approaches the work of art with objectivity to say the truth. That this is what makes this work thick. This is what makes this work great. But there might be some things that the author needs to work on. So it's about balanced judgment. Criticism is about balanced judgment. Balanced evaluation of the work of art. In fact, if you're a good critic, you should first of all look for the 
things, for the things that make that art world great. First of all, and they should be like 80%. But you also need to understand that. But you need to also understand that ad works are not always perfect. There might be something, one or two things, that the author needed to work on that you identified. So let's say 80% praise and 20% uh, negative statement. That's if there is any. The critic approaches the text just like he or she would approach life. We all strive for perfection. And the artwork, as human beings, we all strive for perfection. And the artwork is a product of human beings who strive for perfection, but never attain it. So the artwork will just be like the creator, an individual aspiring for perfection, yet still having marks of frailty. Yes, so the work of art will be good. 80%, 90%, but there has to be, there might be something. Some things, some aspects of it that might need to be worked on. That is the mindset that the critic uses or deploys when approaching a text. And this usually comes out in book reviews. Here it comes out in book reviews. Especially in the evaluation of the work. Okay, in the evaluation of the work. Especially in the evaluation of the work. The aspect of the review called evaluation. That is where the reviewer makes a value judgment on the text. That's where the reviewer makes value judgment on the text. That's where the reviewer makes value judgment on the text. Talking about its merits and demerits, its greatness and otherwise. And all have said laudable things about criticism in this one sentence. It describes criticism as a, a disinterested endeavor to learn and propagate the best that is known and thought in the world. Practically justifying why we should see literary criticism as a noble profession. As a noble profession. One that is practiced by the best man. Because literary criticism utilizes the human faculty. It is what you might call a brain work. It's an intellectual exercise. And the task is onerous. Because the critic has to decide on the greatness or otherwise of the work of art. So it takes someone with an elevated mind to engage in literary criticism. That's why it is the best that is taught in the world. The best that is known in the world. Learn and propagate. So the critic, the critic 
is a lifelong learner. The critic is a lifelong learner. In the sense that he is always he or she is always reading. You cannot be a critic if you can't read. And you will not do well in this course if you're not a good reader. And your mind has to be elevated for you to comprehend all the isms that we discuss in this course. All the ideologies, whether existentialism, whether neoliberalism, whether postcolonialism, whether Marxism. All right? Your mind has to be elevated, sharp, you have to comprehend. All of them. Not to talk of being able to apply them to works of literature. When you see certain statements or certain situations in a work of literature, you say, This is what it means in this particular field. This is what it elicits in this particular field. And how do you get this kind of mind? It is by constant study, constant renewal of your mind. It should be a continual renewal of your mind through what? Through reading. The critic never stops reading. And the critic does not disparage any material. Because the critic, for the critic to succeed is that he or she has to read widely. So he does not select what to read or what not to read. So that's why critics are the best brains around. Critics in any area are the best brains in that area. They do not only learn, they also propagate. That means they they propound theories, they, they fashion concepts, they bring to birth new ideas, new ideologies, quality critics are always creating new terminologies, new ideologies, new theories. They propagate. They birth new ideas. Okay? The critics are not satisfied with the, with the already existing isms. They want to add new isms to the already existing ones. And so if you are going to be a critic, you should not only um, apply the isms that are around, you must also create your own isms. Right? You should be able to create your own isms. Critic. And not only creating, it has to occupy a reasonable space in cultural discourses. It has to fill a vacuum. Okay? So, for instance, if you look at at some of the theories we have here, we have like realism, idealism, neocriticism, structuralism, stylistic criticism, post-structuralism, existentialism, Marxism, we have psychoanalysis, we have trauma theory, we have feminism, We have reader response. We have post-colonialism. We have post postcolonialism. We have postmodernism. We have post postmodernism. We have eco criticism. We have interdisciplinarity. We have queer theory. We have infantism. Okay.
And so you should not be satisfied with this one. You can also bring yours. Because when you study a particular field very well, you will see spaces, vacuums that need to be filled. For instance, I proposed infantism when I realized that there was something missing in the feminist discourse. And I proposed post postcolonialism when I realized that there was something missing in the postcolonial discourse. And in a recent paper, I proposed the neocolonialism because I saw some limitations in the neocolonial fear, which is an aspect of the postcolonial fear. So there will always be, because you can come along and see other vacuums that need to be filled. So to learn, but you cannot propagate without learning. You have to study what others have already done. And you have to study it very well to see where there is a problem. And then you now create a concept to surmount that problem, or to feel that battle. So to learn and to do what? Propagate the best that is thought I know in the world. The best that is thought I know in the world is nothing other than ideology. Ideologies. You cannot propound theories when you are not mentally sound. You're not intellectually sound. You know intellectually sound people who propose new ideas because everything that we do in the world revolves around ideologies. Even if one somebody wants you to go to war today, they have to sell you an ideology that will inspire you to go to war. Alright, they will tell you war, when you go to war you are the hero of the nation, you know, you have made sacrifices to the nation and the nation will honor you, it's a mark of honor, and before you know it, no one will ask you to pick up the weapon, to pick up the weapon and say I'm ready, ready to serve the nation, right, that it's an ideology, right, even this Al Qaeda, this son, um, this this terrorists, they indoctrinate people with down ideologies. And I can assure you that if they take you to a terrorist camp and they indoctrinate you for one month, you will wonder why people in certain places are still alive. So they say, give me the bomb, give me the bomb, I'm going there. I'm going to finish them. Because you have been, you have been indoctrinated with an ideology. All right? And I've always said it that the stories we read in literature are not innocent. Okay? In these stories, we hide ideologies. Because you can't just come, to, come and tell somebody, this is, um, um, this is the oppressor, this is the oppressed. They will not understand. Well, you, all you need to do is to tell a story. Right? You tell a story. In that story, you infuse the ideology. So there are no innocent stories. Which is why we need literary criticism to discern the ideologies and stories that we are told or that we even tell to others. That's how it works. There are no innocent stories. Stories are undergirded with isms. But they don't want to come and preach the ism to you directly. They simply sell you a story. Because a story can get into the innermost part of the human mind. The human mind cannot resist stories. OK? The, a, 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 a story that is infused with patriarchal ideologies will be told to make the woman believe in the superiority of the man. that the world should be ruled by men, that the family should be ruled by a man, all right? And these stories are told 
over the ages. So that even women come and come, will come and say, um, you are my man, you are my husband, I'm going to submit to you. Because the woman has been raised with patriarchal stories, stories that promote patriarchy. And so even sometimes when the woman, when the uh, uh, lady has a problem in the husband's house and goes to the mother, the mother says, go back and submit to your husband. The husband is the head of the family. Okay? And then you go to church, they tell you the same thing. If you are going to marry this man, you have to be ready to submit to this man because he's the head of the family. It's a patriarchal story. The entire Bible is a patriarchal text. It's a text that promotes patriarchy. All right? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, there's no woman there. Right? So the man is the head. So, in feminism, what women are trying to do is to counter the temple stories with stories that promote gender relevance, the female gender relevance. Even though some of them do not promote matriarchy, all right? Most Feminist discourses, I've never seen the promotion of matriarchy. That is the, the, the rule by mothers, the rule by women. They simply want to be equal. But there has to be a leader. So if you do not want the man to lead, then why don't you step up and be the leader instead of trying to be equal? Because there has to be a center. What am I called, what am I called logos? So we could see that probably the, 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 the major problem with the feminist discourse is the, the gospel of equality, which is not realistic. So either you say, okay, the men have not been able to rule, well, let us be the rulers. Let us be the father. Let us, let us take the place of the father so that we have matriarchy. Because of course, we've had matriarchal societies before. Society is ruled by women. That is, rather than for you to say, let no be no leader, let us all be equal. All right? In traditional perception of reality, it's difficult not to have a leader and still have the society succeed. So I don't think there's anything wrong if we allow women to be, um, we, are, we return the society into matriarchal society if it will work. Because what you observe is that um, when women have power, they want to show it off. And not show it off, they also want to rub it in. Right? And that's basically where the problem begins. Okay, so we are not actually talking about that. We are simply saying that stories could be told to infuse um, patriarchal ideologies, and they could be counter stories to oppose such ideologies, and that there are no innocent stories. That's what we are talking about. We can also define literary criticism. We can also define literary criticism. As a discipline Activity as a discipline activity. Characterism as a what? Discipline activity. That describes that describes studies, analyzes, justifies, interprets. So note that each 
of the terms found in that definition is synonymous with criticism or with what criticism does. But that I mean is Christ. Criticism is Christ. What is all about? Okay? The description of the world of God. A critic can engage in the description of the world of God. Right? And that would be criticism. A critic can study the world of God. And that would be criticism. Analysis. When you ask, when you ask to analyze the work of art, that is criticism. Okay. On my website, you will see most of the topic is an analysis of one upon an elephant, an analysis of let me die alone. That is criticism. So it's not all the time that you hear criticism. You have to wait until you hear criticism. All right. You can hear study. You can hear analyze. And here describe or pass for the critiquing of the work of God. Because that's another term that we need to check. So to critique the work of God can be as a noun as a verb. The critique. The critique of this work is how you write. C R I T I Q E. Critique the word. Critique this word. Then another term is justifies. Justify. So you can ask someone justify the title of the novel, Unexpected Joy and Joy. Justify the title of the novel, Unexpected Joy and Joy. Okay? That's the term to say the criticism. Now we can say why the title fits. Okay? So the novel appears to be to be a comedy, given that it has a happy ending. When Mama Rojo and Nitake reunite in Nigeria after years of being separated, when Mama Rojo stayed in Nigeria and Nitake stayed in Ghana. So the fact that they, they meet unexpectedly in the morning is what makes the title of the novel act, unexpected joy at dawn. Interpret. That's another term for criticism, what literary criticism does. The critic interprets the work of art. Remember, not everyone is as knowledgeable as a critic. The critic is up there, right? Intellectually. And he has, he or she has a duty to educate others on what the work about means. Some people can read the work about without knowing what it means. But the critic, who is well versed, who is widely educated, who is widely read, be able to read the work and then tell the others what it means. So it's the duty of the critic to do what? To interpret the work of literature, to the understanding of the other creatures. Again, the task of the critic is onerous. It places a huge responsibility on the critic, meaning that he must not fail. 
And for him not to fail, he has to be or she has to be on his on that tool. The critic evaluates your work of art. Criticism is about evaluating your work of art. As I said, this one is really found in book review. The aspects of book review called evaluation is the most important aspect of the review. Because that is where we talk about the strength and the weaknesses of the text. So the other aspect, like the content analysis, might just be interpretation, right? But evaluation is where you talk about the merit and the demerit of the work. So when you put all these terms together, description, study, analysis, justification, interpretation, evaluation, you have the different terms that could replace criticism. All the different activities that the critic engages in. Literary criticism formulates aesthetic and methodological principles devised by critics in the evaluation of literary texts. Literary criticism formulates aesthetic and methodological principles utilized by critics in the evaluation of literary texts. <coughs> literary criticism formulates aesthetic and methodological principles utilized by critics in the evaluation of literary texts. I'll check it again. Literary criticism formulates aesthetic and methodological principles utilized by critics in the evaluation of literary texts. So this is where the idea of um, propagation comes in. So, Another aspect of literary criticism is the formulation of critical standards for the interpretation of texts or works of art. The formulation of literary principles or literary standards or critical standards that will help us make value judgment on the work of art. That's another aspect of literary criticism. The critic has to go to the text with standardized rules, which will help him or her explain, interpret, criticize the work. So the, 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 the literary critic is armed with the principles for literary interpretation. He or she knows what the rules are. The things that make the work of art great, and the things that when they are absent, the work of art will not be great. We call them aesthetic and methodological principles. Principles are rules. Utilized by the critic in interpretation of work. The critic most times, the critic most times bases his opinion about the text on existing rules on literary interpretation. He doesn't have his own rules, but he makes use of the rules that are available, that everybody, everyone has agreed upon. And he uses the rule to interpret the text. It will be these rules that will inform the critic's opinion about the text. The critic should not impose his personal opinion on a text, but his opinion should be based on existing rules. So the jobs of the critic 
could be back into that other record in the football match. He has the right to say stop or continue or penalty or go cancel. But before he makes that decision, he must be informed about the existing rules in football. Because the rules are the things that guide him in making his decisions. All right? He might make a mistake once in a while, but 90% of the time, the referee is correct. Because if he says offside, then the rule on offside is there. To guide him. It's only about maybe 20% or 10% or 5% of the time that people argue it is not offside. The referee didn't look well. The referee was biased. The referee did not want Nigeria to win. Right? But 90% of the time, everybody will say, oh, it's offside. Because we all know the rules of the game. So think of the try criticism as this game with his own rules and the critic as a referee. Who will execute the, 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 the game based on the existing rules? So as you are upcoming critic, you should master, you should strive to master the rules of literary criticism. To strive to master the rules of literary criticism. You get it. There are two broad types of criticism. There are two broad types of criticism. There are two broad types of criticism. We have theoretical criticism, and we have practical criticism. We have theoretical criticism, and we have practical criticism. Theoretical, theoretical criticism is one in which we formulate theories for the interpretation of literature or other artworks. In theoretical criticism, we formulate, we formulate theories. Theoretical, theoretical criticism is interested in the formulation, is concerned with the formulation of theories for the interpretation of our works. The interpretation of our work, or works of art. Remember that the literary text is an artwork, including painting, or drawing, or carving. Or sculpture. Just that we are dealing with literature. So in theoretical criticism, we formulate theories for the interpretation of the literary text or any art work. And then, and then we have practical criticism which is interested in the application of the theory to the, to the text, or to the artwork. The application of the theory to the artwork. In practical criticism, we are interested in applying the theory that we created, that we formulated in theoretical criticism, to the artwork, to the literature. The literature text. That is why another name for practical criticism is applied criticism. Another name for another name for 
practical criticism is what? Applied criticism. Applied criticism. When we are talking about practical or applied criticism, we have two types of critics. We have two types of critics. We have two types of critics. We have, we have the absolute critic, we have the relative critic. Absolute. The absolute critic uses only one theory all the time. application of critical theory to a literary text. The application of a literary theory to a literary text. Actually, we have theories in different fields of study. We go to economics, we have economic theories. We have theories in biology. Another discipline. And so we have literary theory. But you need to understand that most literary theories are adapted from other fields. Most literary theories are adapted from where? Other fields. Which is why we should be reminded of the need for the literary critic to be. A voracious reader, somebody, a man of culture, someone who reads from different material. (coughs) 
So most literary crit, uh, crit, uh, crit, most literary theories are adapted from other fields. Say psychology. Say psychology, where you get psychoanalysis. The trauma theory is taken from psychology as well. Most literary theories are taken from sociology and anthropology. Most, most are inspired by theories in history. So, literary criticism is an interdisciplinary field. An interdisciplinary field. Interpretism is interdisciplinary. So there's no way you can study interpretism without referring to history, to psychology, to biology, to science. You must know something in all these fields. So the, 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 the definition by Tyson that literary criticism is the application of critical theory to literary text. Aims to emphasize practical criticism. What does it mean to start? Practical criticism. Because what is practical criticism? What is practical criticism? The application of literary theory to the text. And what's the other name for practical criticism? Okay, this guy's a wonderful class. What was it that? We have great So it should be noted that it should be noted that criticism can be conscious or unconscious. Criticism can be conscious or unconscious. So it is at this level that we say that criticism is inevitable. You can write it down. Criticism is what? Inevitable. Criticism is inevitable. That means, you, that, means that you cannot but criticize. You must let your opinion know. You cannot but criticize. Even when you say you don't want to criticize, you cannot help but criticize. Criticism is what? Inevitable. You must make your opinion move. You cannot but criticize. All of us, at one time or another, have been involved in criticism. And remember, 
is not only a literature text that are criticized, all cultural objects are subject to criticism. Like film. It was a film. Film. A film. Or perhaps the drawing of the president that you see on the road. Or any artwork that you see in the art gallery. You must make your opinion known. When you can say, I like this painting. It's so beautiful. Alright? Oh, I didn't enjoy that movie. It was boring. I didn't like that movie. It was boring. But that movie was so interesting. Right? That is literary criticism. You're already in the realm of literary criticism, but you are mostly uninformed. All right? And such criticism is impressionist. Is what? Impressionistic. So impressionistic criticism is a form of uninformed criticism. And it is what most lay people engage in. Most uninformed people, most people that are not schooled in the art of criticism, they will be practicing impressionistic criticism. They start reading a book and say it's boring. This book is boring, I don't like it. That's impressionistic based on their own impression. And that's uninformed criticism, uninformed. Now, we are trying to raise you into being informed critics, conscious critics. The unconscious ones are those who use impressionistic standards to judge a work. Remember, criticism is inevitable. So since you cannot help but criticize, why not be a good one? Why not be a conscious one? and I'll be an informed critic by paying attention to this class and learning all the theories that you need to learn so that when you see a cultural object anywhere, any point, at any point, you're able to make informed judgment on that work. That's the way to go. That's the way to go. Because either you make an informed statement about that artwork, or you make an uninformed statement about the artwork. Okay? For instance, you see an artwork of a human figure with a hole in the stomach. And you're like, so this man didn't know how to make this stomach. So I made the stomach round, but now there's gold in the stomach. That's uninformed. All right? Because the hole in the stomach of that object simply means that there's a, there, it's a depiction of hunger. That there's something wrong where food should be. So it depressed instead of being food. The, the person it depicts poverty, hunger. That's informed criticism. Right? The uninformed criticism will say that the, uh, the, uh, the artist didn't know how to make the belly. Like the normal belly. Okay. So, when we interpret a literary text, when we interpret a literary text, we are doing literary criticism. When we say what a text means, we are engaging in literary criticism. When we say what a text means, we are engaging in literary criticism. When we say what a text means, when we interpret a, te a literary text, what we are doing is what? Literary criticism. But when we examine the criteria upon which an interpretation rests, but when we examine the criteria upon which an interpretation rests, 
we are doing critical theory. We examine the criteria upon which an interpretation rests. We are doing critical theory. When we examine the principles used in the, in the interpretation of literature, we are engaging in critical theory. So there are two aspects. There are two aspects of criticism. The formulation of theories and the application of the theories to the text. Okay? When we interpret a literary text, we are doing literary criticism. <coughs> but when we examine the criteria upon which our interpretation of the text rests, we are engaging in what? Critical fear. That's it. And so I'm going to give two topics. They are going to tell me which one implies critical theory, which one implies application of theory. Which one implies critical theory, and which one implies literary criticism. Number one, the Infantist Manifesto, an excursion on infant criticism. was published by A. in 2008. The Infantist Manifesto, an expression on infant criticism, an expression Number two, an infantist reading of A. Your items past equals. An infantist reading of A. Your items past equals. Infantist reading of the items past. The Infantist Manifesto, an excursion on infant criticism, is critical theory. Whereas an infantist reading of the items past is literary criticism. Because then we are applying infantism to the text past Whereas in the first one, we are simply talking about the theory uh, infantism. So what is literary theory? What is literary theory? Literary theory refers to a body of ideas body of ideas and methods used in the practical reading of literature. Literary theory refers to a body of ideas and methods used in the practical reading of literature. Body of ideas and methods. I also call it a set of principles. I also call it a set of principles. I also call it a set of principles. 
utilized in the interpretation of literature. Try theory implies the description of the underlying principle, which the church is uh, is studying and understood. The description of the underlying principle, which the church studied and understood. Which the church studied and understood. 